Uh, my name is Neil Homer. I'm from the planning consultancy O'Neill Homer Limited. Um, uh, welcoming you to uh, workshop A, um, sustainable development, community leadership and neighborhood planning. Um, so uh, if those are things you're interested in, you're in the right place. If they're not, then you're not. Um, uh, we have 55 minutes to, to tell three stories. Uh, and I've been joined by uh, my colleagues, Richard, Celia and Mervyn, and I'll introduce them to you in a moment. Um, we've just run the first session and it seemed best um, to, to take questions at the end, although I need to make sure that I leave enough time for colleagues to, to answer those questions, uh, as opposed to the raise hand function as we go through, because I don't think that will work very well in this format. Um, you may already see that the chat uh, function is available to you um, in your Zoom app. So if you have a question to ask us, then um, then please do so and use the, the, the chat function to do that. Um, so uh, we have um, uh, pulled together this session based on uh, the experience of um, three of our clients, um, whom we've helped um, over the last five or six years between them. Um, different types of parish in different parts of the country facing different kinds of issues, but all, I think, um, uh, giving us insights into uh, not just the mechanics of neighbourhood planning, in fact, not very much about the mechanics of neighbourhood planning, but more of the the ways that town and parish councils have have used plans to face up to those issues and and have thought about the long term um, and have managed expectations and relationships in 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 bringing their projects forward um, each in their own you know to fit their own circumstances so and we're going to tease that out uh, of my um, of colleagues as we go through so um so welcome uh, what I will do is ask each of them to introduce themselves and to explain who they are and uh, and what they're doing, what they were doing <laughs> in terms of uh, wanting to to be part of their respective uh, neighbourhood plan uh, projects. So if I can start with, uh, I should do it the other way around this time, uh, Mervyn. Hi, my name is Mervyn Hall. I, I'm a councillor on Marlborough Town Council. Um, I'm in my ninth year as a councillor and I've lived in Marlborough for 18 years now, so I'm not, I'm not native to the town, but I've lived here long enough to know how it works. Um, my background is I'm an engineer um, and I came, became a town councillor because I wanted to put something back into the community that I, I've adopted. Um, I ended up being the chair of the Neighbourhood Plan Steering Committee um when we decided to do a neighborhood plan uh, and i rather foolishly volunteered to do it i didn't realize it was such a huge project as it's turned out to be because it's taken something like five years to bring it to fruition thanks mervyn uh richard welcome richard thank you Neil. um i've lived in berkeley uh, with the family for uh, nigh on 25 years, um, but have been a soldier and therefore moved around the world from Salisbury to London to Aberdeen to Santiago in Chile. And, and on leaving the army, I did some consulting, but came to realise... Yes, that I have. I did the 101 thing, um, so they've got a crime reference number. Hang on a second, Richard. Apparently they've got two different sets of suspects. Can I ask everybody that's on the workshop A younger, to a younger group and those. an older group, so I think that they're waiting to see the CCTV to see if that gives them a steer in, in which direction. Is there, is there a Joe Wood on the call? Joe, can you mute, please? Uh -huh. Sorry, Richard, I won't no, be I continue. Yep, yeah, I'll continue. No problem. Yes, um, and we discovered this morning when we went to the UK that some, like an audio sound deck has been taken. So actually, um, um, I don't know whether that would have been the same people to, or different people, or I don't know. I don't think we've got any eyes on patient. that back entrance to the, chalet, to the thingy grotto, um, have we? So the meeting organiser should be able to mute Joe. 
Is there a meeting organiser here? I've sent her a message in the chat to say we can hear you, but... Yeah, you know where the back, where they come out of it at the back, I'm, sort of towards Green. I have some real there. concerns that we might get into a GDPR yeah, issue, considering what she's there. talking about. In me too. Um, um, I don't know if you can contact someone in charge. <laughs> you can mute by clicking on participants and then mute them individually, whoever's in control of this meeting. Yeah, no, I, I don't have that functionality. That's the okay, thing, we don't brilliant. know who's in control. FP hyphen A co-host. And we'll, you automatically is. pass that on to them, do you? Tina yeah. or Lisa. Can't or see. They're here. some very odd reason, I'm Anne Duker, and I seem to be able to mute people when I go into participants. I've no idea why. Yeah. Okay, so I don't need to go back to them. You'll go back to them. Do you, do you um, want me to mute them? Brilliant. Please. Okay, that's great. Thanks for keeping me up to speed, Richard. Much appreciated. I can't Thank do you. that, Anne. So if you're Bye. able to do that, please do that. Um, I have a feeling that as Joe's phone call has just ended, she might be listening back into us soon. Is there a Joe Wood on the call? Joe? She's listed as attending. Mm. We're just trying to get her on to mute. Anne, did you say you could you could mute people on I, I, I've been trying to mute her but can't. Ah, she's muted now. Okay. That's it. Right. Thanks, colleagues. Okay, um, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everybody for your back help. to you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for your help. Um, so I joined the parish council in 2017. So I'm a relative new newbie to, uh, to to local council work, local government work. And uh, after five months, um, after being advised by our local parish council, sorry, our local borough council, facing Stoke and Dean, that neighbourhood planning was a, a good thing. Uh, I volunteered to lead this the, the steering group uh, and and took and took it on from there. I thought it would be an interesting intellectual challenge, um, uh, but it's proved to be a little bit more than that. Uh, we got ours completed uh, very quickly. It was a fairly straightforward task, but we did have a land promoter interest who came in because Spacing Stoke and Dean lost their five-year land supply uh, after about eighteen months which put the pressure on us hugely uh, to get it complete. Um, and I'm prepared to talk about that later. So we got our neighborhood plan made last uh, year, sorry, earlier this year uh, in May. And uh, we are now in the process of about to review it for other reasons. Um, that Neil, I think sums us up. Thanks Richard. Celia. Who are you? Where are you from? What um, what made you want to be involved in this? Um, right, I'm Celia Collett. Um, I've lived in Brightwell, come Sotwell all my life, which is a small village. Um, I've been on the parish council for over three decades, um, and I was a former independent district councillor. And um, I've just always had a passion for engaging um, and empowering people to sort out their own problems really. And um, I was the chair of our first parish plan in 2004. We went on to do another parish plan in 2014, um, but they were, you know, they were claimed by our district and county council as good plans. Um, the only trouble is, they, are, they were only classes guidance. And when we had the opportunity of neighborhood plans giving us a statutory position in the planning um, authority, then we thought in the planning system, um, we thought this would be a good chance to do that. So we did a community led plan shortly after finishing our 2014. Um, uh, uh, we did a community led plan in 2014 and then shortly after decided to do the neighborhood plan, which we um, it was adopted in 2017. However, um, we do realize now that we need to um, refresh it and because of the implications that some of the policies 
we didn't realize might uh, need to be um, just looked at again. And we are also hoping to introduce a design code. And this was with all Neil's help in the first place and he's helping us again. So we're very, very grateful to you Neil for helping us again. You're welcome Celia, thanks for the advert. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, let's go, we'll go back down the line, starting with you, Celia. So can you, can you each put a little bit more flesh on the bones of the, of the, the situation as you were starting your plans? Why, what was going on around you and above you in terms of planning policy that made each of you think, or your, your parish councils, town councils to, to want to do this? um where you thought it could make a difference can you starting with you see if you just sort of explain some of the background and where you started from and and um how that uh took a direction with your project yeah well in oxfordshire we've got a two-tier system so we've got the county council and the district councils um, and then we had three tiers, surely, Celia. Three tiers. <laughs> yeah, with yes, absolutely, Neil. Yeah, and um, two tiers above us. <laughs> and uh, so we knew that we were going. We're getting more and more pressure from the figures that came out from our Schmar and the implications of Oxfordshire having to take a considerable amount of housing. And of course, that was then devolved down to district level and then ultimately the districts devolving it down to parish level. And so although we are a small village and it wasn't, um, we didn't have to take a large housing allocation, we've got two large towns on our doorsteps one immediately on our doorsteps, which was having to take large amounts of houses. And of course, then developers' interest started to come towards us. And we thought we needed to have some mechanism to help us um, not stop development, uh, because we, we've all got to accept change. And if these housing numbers are to be accepted, we've all got to take play our part, but so that we could limit the amount of de development we had, um, A, to avoid coalescence with the near town and just being swallowed up, um, but also to maintain the sense of community we have within, within our village. And so that's why we basically embarked on it. And um, I expect you'll go on further with questions to go on from that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Celia. Um... Richard, what was going on in Berkeley that um, made the parish council think that, you know, we've now really got to act and this is the shape of this, this plan? Our, st our story is similar to, to, uh, to Celia's. Um, our local borough council, which is Basingstoke and Dean, um, were encouraging all the parishes in the borough to develop neighbourhood plans and they had come and spoken to the annual general assembly, um, which was my very first experience, uh, and it, most of it went over my head. But during the course of the next three or four months, um, we got more into it, and I then volunteered to 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 to, to lead it. Um, our target at the time was ten houses, and that had been passed down to us. And while we can play on figures, um, we used that as the guidance, uh, saying that this was a target we had to meet in all our dealings with the uh, local community. Um, on your advice, uh, or, or John Dash's advice, one of your colleagues, we decided to up that figure because we knew that the borough would be reviewing their plan as they are now, they're building a new plan, um, which will complete in 2024. And we wanted to be reassured, and we wanted to reassure the community that we had thought about any further uplift that might take place so we put a target of 15 down and, and that is what we have achieved through our dialogue through our consultation and as it happens currently currently that is the target that space and state indeed have set us which we have now met in their local plan update which is encouraging um, but that's still not done and dusted so we are in the throes of going through a review to see what we might do to, to better the situation in which we are presently find ourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And um, developer interest. 
in your parish at the same yes. time. Yes, thank you. Not um, necessarily waiting for you to come up with the answer. We had a um, a lot of interest. If you look at a map of the Shila, the Shila of, of Berkeley, there is a lot of um, ground where there has been interest expressed in developments. We're in a very popular area. We've got the M4, the A34 running north, south, the M3. Very good train lines from Basingstoke and from Newbury, of course, which is um, uh, only three or four miles away. Um, so it's it's a very desirable area. And uh, during the course of, after about 18 months, during the course of our neighbourhood plan work, we, uh, Basingstoke and Dean lost their five-year land supply. And almost instantaneously, a land promoter uh, applied to build on a field which we had considered, but it was a large field sited in the middle of the village, which in itself is not a bad thing, but it was between the church and the school and very, very prominent, had views over Watership Down or towards Watership Down and vice versa. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of uh, very vociferous local opposition to that. So we decided to fight it and with your help, uh, mounted a campaign against us. Um, but it, because it wasn't right, um, we felt that we should continue with the plan as was and therefore we had this sort of creative tension between the land promoter on the one hand promoting their plan and us promoting our plan um, and that inspired uh, us to move quickly and uh, as a consequence uh, when it went to appeal it was uh, a, 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 the planning inspectorate did a hearing um, he judged in favor of, of our work and dismissed the, the appeal for this large development. Um, and one of the grounds for doing so was the very significant, we use that term, very significant risk it posed to the success of the Neighbourhood Plan at referendum. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, and Mervyn, a, 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 obviously Marlborough, a different place. Um, uh, describe uh, what your town council and your your two, or I suppose originally three neighbouring parish councils, because you will, maybe you can actually just describe the, the the project as well before we before we go on. But just to also describe the sort of issues that um, uh, that the community were talking to you about five or six, seven years ago, and probably for longer than that. Well, there, there was a growing frustration on on the town council that on planning matters we hadn't got much of a voice. Um, we had a district council based in Marlborough, Kennet District Council, till about 15 years ago. And then we adopted a unitary authority, Wiltshire Council, um, and they're based in Trowbridge, which is quite a long way from Marlborough. Um, Wiltshire is geographically quite a large county. So we felt we weren't getting much voice and we were seeing inappropriate developments that, for example, we had three large retirement communities built in the town, which didn't really serve our community. They just attracted people in from places like London because they're very highly priced. And uh, Marlborough was being marketed as an attractive place to retire. So we decided that we needed more of a voice on planning issues. Uh, and that, that's why we got involved in doing a neighborhood plan. We involved the three parishes that surround the town, their rural parishes, um, because our, our current built area goes right up to the parish boundary in a number of areas. And so if there was to be any development, it would inevitably involve those rural parishes around the town as well. Thanks, Mervyn. I think we'll, we'll go back down the line again. So um, you faced, and maybe you described to us the tension between wanting to do something about increasing access to affordable housing on the one hand, but with significant environmental policy constraints on the other that had, I guess, combined to to um, uh, to create the kind of affordability issue that you that you faced in the town for a number of years. Can you just sort of expand on that for us a little bit, please? Yeah, so Marlborough's geographically in a, in, in a difficult place. There, there isn't much available land for building in, in or around the town because we sit in a valley with steep sides. Um, to the south of us is a forest, a Savanac forest, and to the north of us is the Marlborough Downs, which is an extensive chalk downland. So 
if any land becomes available, it's extremely valuable. For that reason, Marlborough is very expensive. We have the highest house prices in Wiltshire. And despite the fact it might appear as a wealthy town, there, there are real pockets of deprivation within Marlborough. And quite a lot of the population re um, rely on social housing in order to live here. And those people are essential to the town's economy. Um, we have a lot of fairly low paid jobs within the town in, in care homes, in, in education, in the shops. And we have quite a large workforce for the size of town. You can see the high street full of shops behind me, um, which is quite large for a town our size. So we felt that there was a strong need for more affordable housing, which was gradually being eroded by sell offs. Um, so the situation was getting worse, not better. Um, and that, that needed to be addressed. And that very much came out in our public consultations. And we did a housing survey, which again, reinforced the fact that we do need more affordable housing within the town. Thanks, Marvin. Uh, Celia, you, at a smaller scale, um, you also face the sort of a dilemma of, of, of um, uh, of wanting to to um, plan positively for the future, but within the infrastructure as well as environmental constraints of what is a you know relatively small village um, um, with with uh, a community that um, would not have expected you to uh, want to. Uh, make proposals for significant numbers of, of houses. How, how did the parish council, how did your team go about figuring out how to strike that the, the right balance and then in in engaging with the community around that, that sort of exercise, if you like, that balancing exercise? Mm. Yes, it is a balance um, because it was quite obvious through our community-led plans before when we'd done housing needs surveys before as well, that there was a lack of affordable housing in the parish. Uh, most of the available small plots, which would have say two or three houses um, that could have had perhaps uh, five um, small dwellings on would go to five or six bedroom luxury houses. And, uh, you know, most of the people, even the ones living in big houses, thought this was disproportionate um, to the community um, because, as Mervyn um, alluded to, uh, we have got a small amount of still social housing owned by a housing association, but every time they sell one, they don't replace it in the village. They go and use that money in the local town because they say they can do two houses which I suppose from their point of view, they're answering a need, but it doesn't help our community. So um, there was lots of factors. And there's also, we are on the edge of the AOMB, we've got a con conservation area. So there's lots of factors to take into account. And then it's trying to, um, with the outside influences, as I've said, of five-year land supplies and, and the housing numbers within Oxfordshire, it's trying to, say if we can create uh it may not be all singing and all dancing but if at least if we can create a neighborhood plan which answers some of those problems then at least um you know if you portray uh, you get that over to the village this is we want you to come along with us on this journey because you've told us that these problems exist now we want you to come along with us and help us develop this neighbourhood plan to try and get that. And that your answer, Celia, was was the answer you ended up with was quite different from where you started from, though, it wasn't was. it? I think it'd be interesting it just to yeah. just to explore on that a bit. You I mean just for everybody else's benefit, a, um, a, a plan that started by thinking that that it needed to provide for a dozen homes ended up yeah. providing for nearly 70. Can you just yeah. explain <laughs> why you ended up with that answer and how on earth? Well, your as, parish council yeah. took people with you well as we went along i mean it is communication i as i said in the past it's communication 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 because we needed to communicate all these things which were the outside influences were having an impact in all, in all the research we were doing and all the 
actual uh, pressure we had from developers. So there was lots of, as soon as you say you're going to do a neighbourhood plan, every big developer comes out of the um, pipe work and wants to you to do, and a lot of it was large development. And we knew that without a five-year land supply and with the local council still developing their local plan, we were in a really difficult position because we had to accept some housing numbers. And so we took, a bit like Richard, the difficult decision to say, we are going to actually go further than what's required because we think this is the only way we will stop this constant pressure from developers on our community. And have you seen the benefit of taking that approach, Celia, since the plan was made? Absolutely. But uh, this is why, you know, although it is a lot of work, you have to be prepared to look at your plan again, because you can see how all the time developers are just looking for those little things you, you hadn't realised. You thought you'd, you'd done all this hard work and you'd sealed all the holes and then you suddenly either the government or the local plan or five-year housing supply, anything they can find a little hole in it and then you start to get the pressures again. And so you think, no, look at it again. And particularly, we did a design guide in our first one, which was good, but now we've got the chance of doing a design code, which is then a statutory instrument. We thought, yes, it's our chance now to go even further because some of the developments we were getting it wasn't the design that it's not like we're trying to stop progress but it we're missing opportunities especially around sustainable buildings and everything like that so yes it's just enable us to go a bit further but i think if you always communicate and people get used to you going back to them to get the answers then the majority of people, a bit like Mervyn said, will come along with you. You're not going to get the doubters and the, you just have to just keep trying to manage them. But the majority of people see what you're trying to do and they come along with you on the journey. Thanks, Celia. Uh, Richard, you, you, you're, you weren't, as you just described a moment ago, weren't quite in the same um, sort of balancing situation as, as the other two, but you still have the job to, to do. And you've talked about um the relationship with the planning authority um might be worth just exp expanding on that um as it's such it seems to be such a key factor in in the success of neighborhood planning is the is the the extent to which neighborhood planning teams can um can have a good working relationship with their planning authority but also in terms of you working with um the the land interests in your patch and and the sort of challenge that that may have presented to a parish council that probably wouldn't have been used to having to engage with those kinds of partners um, in this way before. Yes, that's very true. The um, basin staking team were, were, were helpful. We, we um, made a point of getting on with them right from the outset. This, the same planning officer um, that we started with who had presented to the parish council back in 2000, early 2017, is still in post today. I think we're fortunate in having him in post today, uh, and it, he is he is on my uh, my my speed dial on my phone, um, and we talk probably now once every ten days or so. Um, back in the day, on during the neighbourhood plan, it was probably once a day, um, and it was it, it is important to strike up a relationship because whatever the the ups and downs you are going to be dealing with them after the neighborhood plan has been made and into the future so that relationship i i feel is very important but the relationship with the land interests and and the community um is obviously critical and and, 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 and both my colleagues have mentioned how important it is to get the buy-in from um the community when we when we started off um we put up in the entrance of the village um, village hall a sign which said what is your ambition for Berkeley and we looked forward we didn't look back um, there's plenty of stories about how difficult planning is and how terrible people's experience of planning was 
Uh, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to look forward and say, these are the rules around neighborhood planning. This is what localism, localism means for us. And this is what we can get from it. And we started off with the, um, the whole question of the, of, of the numbers, but then we added to that and looked at other things like transport, tourism, uh, design, uh, it, green infrastructure, uh, and so it grew into a, a, a much more fulsome and wholesome and, and sellable package. And people will buy into it if they believe that that is something which uh, they can see clearly some benefit from. The land interests uh, were, were quite many, were, sorry, were many, and we engaged with them early. One of the uh, key factors for us was the uh, AOMB. There were a couple of sites, and one of which was chosen in the uh, North Wessex Downs AMB. And there were some objections uh, inevitably to us thinking about that site and what a precedent that might set. So right from the get-go, I mean, probably one of the first people we consulted were the AOMB, who came and said quietly um, below the radar, yep, we're comfortable with what you're proposing. And uh, that was helpful to us, but it was frustrating because it wasn't until Regulation 16 that they actually said so publicly. So we were always having to fend off criticism about building in the AUMB. Um, and there were rules around that which we had to meet, extra documentation we had to provide and so on and so forth. Um, but that really sums up, sums up um, all, the, all the issues that we faced in terms of consultation with landowners and, and the AUMB. Thanks, Richard. Mervyn, uh, you had to face a number of issues in terms of articulating and arguing your vision um, for, for addressing these issues uh, and striking this balance in a way that were it left to, to the planning, your planning authority, they would probably have struck that balance in a different way um, and uh, were not enthusiastic um, about what you were trying to do. How did you try to resolve that with them? And, and then how, you, how did you work with, with, the, um, with the land interests in, in, in your patch when you were looking to allocate land? Well, I, I think with, with Wiltshire Council, the, um, in the end, it was the overwhelming evidence for the, the need for affordable housing that they had to listen to. Um, they were anti us delving into that area at first. They didn't want us to do a housing survey, for example, and tried to discourage us from doing it, um, which only prompted us even more to do it. <laughs> so we did, and it backed up our argument very strongly that, that there is a strong need for more social housing within the town, and that, that needs very strong within the community. Um, so there, there was a little bit of friction over that. Uh, I think partly they felt it was their domain and how dare we get involved in it. Um, there was a little bit of that going on. The land interests were fairly easy to engage with. We've got two very large institutional landowners um, who, who form the majority of the land interest around the town and they're quite socially responsible landowners. Um, I won't name them but they're, they're, they're large well-known institutions and they were easy to engage with and they were sympathetic to what we were saying um, and, and of course we have to build commercial homes in order to get the affordable homes. The, the normal formula in Marlborough is for any housing development 40% have to be affordable um, and we managed to negotiate with these two landowners that they're their land it would be 50% so we've got a, a larger proportion of affordable homes. Um, I see there's a question on the uh, chat in how, how do you ensure that affordable homes stay affordable? Well you can't totally, with, within the definition of affordable homes there are several categories and there's shared equity, there's social rent and there's the new one of starter homes for young people. Um, most of the affordable homes in Marlborough tend to be social rent managed by, owned by housing associations. And there are two things which erode the number of houses in that category. One is the right to buy, which is not that common, 
uh, certainly here because they're still quite expensive. And the other one is when the housing association sells them off. And, and our largest housing association has a policy of selling off pre-1980 homes that become vacant. So you lose them that way. So in order to maintain the numbers under the current system, you have to build more. There are other ways of doing it. We could buy up existing properties and turn them into social housing, as, as used to happen in the 1950s in Marlborough. So there are other solutions, but that's political and we have to work within the system we've got. Thanks, Mervyn. Um, uh, whilst we're with you then in that case, um, you've had to carry the community with you and you've had to um, work with the planning authority and with land interests in ways that um, you've not had to before. Um, and that, that requires a, you know, a, a degree of, of, of quite a strong degree, I think, of community leadership that perhaps the town council and the other two parish councils have not had to show before. In your case, complicated further, I guess, and we've not mentioned this yet, but with the fact that you chose to, to prepare your neighbourhood plan to cover not just the town, but, the, but um, three of your, the three adjoining parishes to the town. Um, uh, how, 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 how able was the town council as an organisation to step into that challenge? And, and to do these things where it, where it hadn't really had much previous experience of doing this, because it does, we do know, we hear it often that, that towns and parish councils are, are concerned about, about these matters and it can often put them off pursuing a neighborhood plan project uh, because of the, the extent of, and complexity of these challenges. How, how did you, how, how did the, your town council um, go into this did you go into it with your eyes open and 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 did it work well once we'd formed the steering group we, we were determined to do a lot of public consultation uh, and the neighborhood plan project in marlborough has probably done more public consultation than anything in the last 30 years so it's not something that the town was particularly used to but what came out were a whole wide range of issues not just neighborhood planning issues but there are a lot of other issues came out as well and it, and it clearly showed that public consultation a is important and b it had been necessary for some time and hadn't really happened so what one of the changes within the town council is that they now consult more widely on issues that are likely to be controversial working with three other councils again it's quite complex particularly as we went through elections and all the councils councillors changed um, that's proved to be quite challenging. We lost one parish along the way, a tiny parish of only 180 people that got kind of hijacked by an anti-housing group. Um, so they, they left the project, um, but we reformed it around the remaining councils. But it's taken a lot of persuasion and the evidence of our consultations, which is undeniable once you do an, a proper public consultation for the way the public are thinking. And that tends to persuade councillors rather than accept just their own opinion, which, which used to be the case quite a lot of the time. Do you think the town council will come out of this better than it started? Has the neighbourhood plan made a difference to 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 the sort of I don't know confidence maybe of the town council um, maybe more so than it when it entered the project yes yeah, so too early to tell do you think this is the third town council that I've sit, sat on um, so I've been through two elections and yes I, I would say it's very different from the one I joined which tended to argue a lot about issues and not consult um, and it's also very interesting that the three unitary councillors in this area have joined the town council this time around so there's a lot more working together and cooperation with Wiltshire council and we feel we've got much more of a voice there now than we we had before so yes slowly things are changing and I think it's strengthened us thanks Mervyn same question to you really Celia the the um in terms of the 
the role you've described how important it has been to engage the community but and do you feel like that was enough that to, to galvanize and to give your parish council the small parish council the confidence to stick its head above the parapet and 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 see the project uh through in a way that perhaps it you know it might have not had that confidence to do 10 15 years ago even though it was kind of doing community-led plans have you seen the difference yeah well i think it's actually helped us because you're always going to with the changes in the council um going to get doubters in your own council and um without the community consultation i think those especially if they're very vocal can actually um cover up what the community is thinking because they put their own opinion on it and then say well that's what i've spoken to people about and unless you have got the evidence behind you which community consultation gives you the evidence you can't oppose that and they you know you can get one or two very disruptive characters on a council and it can be very difficult to manage but i think that's where community consultation is the answer because it's then not any individual's opinion, it's actually the majority, and people have to go with the majority, however much they dislike it at times, and the majority of people feel like that. So I think that's a benefit, and I think that's a benefit actually to a council, because most people come on to a council with the passion that they want to help the community. And you can lose your way when you get into individual arguments but i think if you keep that focus on evidence base from the community it helps you to keep you keep you on the right track it's not easy but I think i'm just thinking Celia. one of one of the things i know about your <laughs> parish council is that um compared to many you have been really quite tenacious in tracking how well your planning authority implements your policies in day-to-day yes. -day planning applications. Mm -hmm. Has that kept the parish council actively engaged in planning because you've been doing that, do you think? Absolutely, because I think when a controversial planning application comes before us and then we get residents or neighbours saying, well, it's not in the neighbourhood plan, we do take every effort to explain what we've done. We challenge the officers at their decisions. We try and get our district council to take it to committee so we can argue at a committee level. It's not always successful, but um, as you yourself, who helped us on an appeal um, with a boundary issue, it did actually uh, make the difference for us winning that appeal because we had our neighbor plan, the officer was against us, the planning committee were for us, we managed to persuade them, and then the inspector came down on our side. So, you know, it, we have got evidence now, we can say, well, we can't win everything, but look, we have won some things. You know, and it's it may only be small wins in some cases, but all those add up to the evidence you can present back to the community and say, okay, it's not going to be, an, um an overarching success with everything but these are the wins because of our neighborhood plans we have had thanks celia richard um has, has your parish council come out of your project better than it went into it do you think uh, in, in 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 its confidence not just in planning perhaps but mostly in planning but has it made a difference to your parish council in showing the kind of community leadership that was necessary to get the plan through in the first place? Um, the answer with so many of these questions is yes and no. Uh, <laughs> that might sound slightly strange, but um, much of what Claire has said is, is absolutely true of us. And I think um, the, the yes part is that um, it's given them a much greater awareness of what their role in scrutinizing planning and, and looking at planning applications is um instead of instead of saying well you know what do i feel that they, they now are looking at it and saying well what do the rules say um what is appropriate what what guidance can we find in in handling this 
Um, so you're looking at it much more, looking at applications much more objectively, and there's a sort of sense of community, and that was reinforced by um, the the objection to the major planning application we had, which I described earlier as being seen off by the by the planning inspectorate. Um, so it was in that sense a, a sort of an either either or. You know, you get the neighbourhood plan, which which will see, help see this off or you don't, in which case you'll get two sets of development. Um, and that really focused minds. I think the other side of the coin is that planning is, is difficult. It's not in a box. You can't say, if you do this, it's not an engineer solution. If you do this, that will happen. Um, if you press this button, you'll get this answer. It's very much... Um, interpretive it's it's open to uh to an extent to personalities but also uh shifting sounds in terms of policies uh, which are constantly being reviewed and updated uh, and that poses small parishes um a problem um, because who is the expert and i think it's given parishes on the one hand an expertise but it, that expertise resides in dare i say people like us um, who have gone through the mill. So it's a very narrow expertise. Uh, and, and were we to change, the parish council would then find, would struggle a bit um, in, in dealing with these issues going forward. But at least they have a better understanding of it now. And I think that is what is important. Um, the downside, of course, is that um, it's a tech, it was, it's a difficult subject. It's a technical subject, and um, we are not the masters, uh, and we do rely on experts um, in dealing with neighbourhood planning, such as ourselves. Thank you. Oh, what an excellent point! <laughs> we don't want you to become too expert, Richard. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to make a living. Um, no, thank you very much for that. Um, we have had, and I've been able to make a little bit more time at the end of this workshop on the first one. So we have had some questions and, and thank you to Mervyn for our answering, um, uh, was it Mike's question? Um, no, Anne's question from Oldbourne about, about affordable housing. Uh, Mike from Yates. Oh, here's a thorny one. If the planning authority brings in a lewd local plan, can it override the neighbourhood plan? Well, I can answer that one easily. Yes, it can. I think what you've heard here from all three stories was uh, how the local councils had anticipated what was coming over the hill. And, and this is almost always the case. There is so little, so rarely a, a sort of a steady state where there isn't something or other coming over the hill that you have to invest a lot of time and energy anticipating the nature of that um, and and hedging frankly uh, and that's what each of these three projects um, did uh, none of them were operating in a, a very clear fixed um, strategic policy framework they all had to um figure out where their planning authority was heading and and some planning authorities are more willing to to tell you <laughs> than others uh, and so um uh, even though technically whatever is the latest plan takes precedence if there is a conflict um i don't anticipate in fact there wasn't any difference when when south oxfordshire adopted its local plan that undermined anything in in brightwell's plan nor do we expect there to be in berkeley uh, or I would hope Wiltshire's as well in due course. So, but it is about, about anticipation um, and hedging, uh, which requires, it's a bit of science and a bit of art as well, I would have to say. Um, a question for the three, three of you actually, uh, from Christopher Morley. Uh, did you secure engagement with young people? Um, and was there any particular format or method that worked in that respect? A perennial challenge for every neighbourhood plan project, I would say. Um, if, I, if I could start then. Yeah, yes. Um, basically, you've got to go to where the young people are. They won't come to you. So there's no point in running events and in, uh, in the community and expecting them to turn up. Um, 
I do remember going to the rock festival on the edge of town, Manton Fest, which is held every year, and setting up a stall there. And I got fond memories of chasing our gazebo across the field when the wind blew it away. But we persisted and uh, we had some engagement there. I also um, I remember going into the local comprehensive school and engaging with every year group assembly. So I spoke to about 1500 kids over about a week and a half. But I, I would say my advice would be you've got to go to where the kids are, not the other way around. Thanks, Mervyn. Celia or Richard, did you, how did you attempt to tackle this? Um, I visited the schools, but spoke to the headmaster and headmistresses. Um, and there was not detailed engagement in the way that um, Mervyn has described. Um, we did get the primary school to design a logo. That was very nice and thanks to them. But um, there was not, I would, I would say there was not significant outreach now um, to the answer to the question. Uh, we're a very small parish. Um, and I think that for us, the audience are the adults, mostly the adults, um, but we do try and take note of the importance of various things within the village. For example, a play area, the recreational ground, that do affect young people. So that was always a thought in the back of our mind, but we didn't do significant outreach to them now. Thanks, Richard. Celia? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, a bit like Mervyn, we engaged with the school, um, the preschool even, and the Cubs and the Scouts, and, uh, and we haven't got any youth club or anything, but um, we tried to do an engagement through the groups that were in the village yeah thanks Celia. yeah um four more questions let's see if we can tackle some of them um one from councillor mcmahon from hatton regis um uh, a problem that you may face in due course mervyn about a unitary authority adopting a local plan at the very <laughs> last minute that might change um things um i suppose uh a brief answer is, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the, the most up to date plan is the plan that counts. If there's any conflict, then uh, it takes precedent. Um, it can be very irritating and it does happen from time to time um, when a recently made neighbourhood plan or a plan that's at examination um, uh, gets uh, appended to an extent uh, by the adoption of a new local plan. As I said a moment ago, though, councillor, it's 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 about trying to anticipate that. And and if you do have a good working relationship with your planning authority in the way that I think both South Oxfordshire and and Basingstoke and Dean, um, I would describe as two of the better planning authorities, then that dialogue ought to be able to highlight early on, much earlier in the process than by the time you've reached examination, by which point you can't sort of turn back. Well, not easily at least, to highlight those things where there could be a difference. Um, so you are able to, to change your plan to reflect that as necessary, whilst it's still within your gift to do so. Uh, but it can be irritating when change happens at the, at the 11th hour and 59th minute. Um, and that's a particularly difficult thing to, 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 to address. So um, hopefully that's answered your question. Um, uh three more questions how do we quickly grapple with these have we tackled climate change well i suppose you each have in your own ways um uh in in respect of the 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 spatial policy choices that you've made um uh, in marlborough certainly the 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 access to increasing access to affordable housing um, ought to enable uh, your local more of your local workforce to actually live in the town rather than to commute in it primarily by car from places like Swindon. Um, so it's those kinds of spatial policy choices that each of you are making um, well, that I, ought to I, do I, that. But I can add to that, Neil, that we mm. we we had a go at putting a housing standard in, and it's very pleasing. I met with a developer a week ago for one of our sites. And the proposal is to build houses that are 
highly insulated. Every house has a car charger. They're heated by air source heat pumps and there's no gas supply to those houses. So these things are having an impact and we are seeing change. Uh, and that, that's partly because it's in the neighbourhood plan, but partly because of the national trend. Yeah, I mean, indeed, when we, what you're referring to is um, we're road testing in Marlborough and, and a few other neighbourhood plans, the requirement for all new development to be to meet the passive house standard or equivalent. Um, uh, and until a, a, a planning, a neighbor plan examiner tells us that we can't or our clients that they can't, then we're just going to stick with that. And it's good to see developers, I think, with a longer term perspective, um, uh, recognizing that this is going to come over the hill nationally anytime soon anyway so why not try and do it now yeah. um we, we did in our first um you know did have uh, renewable energy policies and and hmm. around the environment but we're hoping to um actually beef that up in our design code because i do think everybody needs to address that in their neighborhood plans yeah i, I perceive that um things have changed a lot in the last three years i think the number of our clients up until then that had shown that much of an interest in climate change as a sort of a policy initiative were relatively few and far between. I think lots of them had been put off by planning authorities saying that there was no discretion available at the local level to come forward with your own policies. But the last two or three years, things have changed significantly and pretty much every client now wants to have something to say about this. And I think those of you that are going through the modification route uh, of your made plans now are, are aiming to to address this more um, significantly than you did first time around. Um, two more questions, although I think we might have technically ran out of time. <laughs> um, uh, about how do we argue against developers who say that the percentage of affordable houses is unviable? Uh, in this case, Marlborough, I think it's fair to say, Mervyn had leverage and. Um, uh, and said that because you, you know, were effectively exceeding your housing target, you didn't need to go allocating these sites if you didn't want to, if you weren't pursuing your vision. And if they didn't want to sign up to delivering um, that percentage, then you'd go elsewhere. So I, th I think you, you used your leverage um, to achieve that. Yes, um, it's a question of getting the landowner on side. They, they then appoint a developer that can put the restrictive covenant on the land that they have to deliver a percentage of affordable housing. Otherwise, they'll just find another developer. Uh, that's the best way of doing it. Indeed. The other question briefly for all three of you is to what extent um, have you had to face the issue of second homes in your town and villages? Not in Marlborough. We, we don't have that issue, really. Celia or Richard, have you, have you got any significant number of those? Uh, we actually over because of the people moving out of London, it's decreased because they are making us our main home and they sometimes have their second home in London. It's quite interesting, the dynamics, particularly over the last um, period of COVID. So, um, yeah, not we haven't got that particular problem just at the moment. Thanks, Celia. Um, Richard, I might have to step in and say we have to say goodbye to those that have joined us for the workshop, conscious that it's a minute to um, to three o'clock, so they're having to go elsewhere. Can I thank everybody for um, for joining the workshop this afternoon? Hopefully you found that interesting and insightful for, for those of you that are thinking about projects or are pursuing projects. Can I thank my, my three colleagues um, for telling their stories? Um, uh, I think in, a, in an engaging way, um, each with their own stories to tell, but um, very well told. So thank you um, to them. Um, if you want to know more about this, if you want to talk to me about how we might be able to help you, then um, our um, exhibition, our virtual exhibition board uh, is on the conference website, uh, which uh, includes our contact details. So. Um, please do get in touch. But um, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.